They want to be able to punish the people that they do not like, conservatives, dissenters, and they want to be able to protect the people that they do like, pro-Palestinians, anti-Semites, people who champion the oppressed as they see them. They are completely partisan and they want to be able to maintain their partisanship. And this kind of bullshit is the way to, to do it. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Glenn Lowry. You've tuned into The Glenn Show. Uh, I teach at Brown University. I'm the Mert Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences there and Professor of Economics. And I'm also a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, the John Paulson Senior Fellow. Um, Manhattan Institute sponsors The Glenn Show. I'm joined uh, today by uh, Amy Wax, who is Robert Mundime Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and a prolific writer and commentator on social issues. and also something of a notorious figure as she's been brought up on charges uh, at her home university, the University of Pennsylvania, very famously so. I mean, it's been very much discussed. Uh, and uh, she's, she's back at the Glenn Show uh, after a hiatus, and I'm happy to welcome her back. Welcome, Amy. Thank you for having me. Nice to be back. Uh, so you're out of the closet now, are you? I, well, I didn't put myself uh, out of the closet. Um, I was outed, I guess, by some kind of leak. We're talking about Amy's ordeal at the University of Pennsylvania, where she's been, as it were, brought up on charges before the faculty sent it at the impetus of her dean at the law school at the University of Pennsylvania for conduct unbecoming, so to speak, of a, a professor. And... Uh, the sanctions are uh, very significant, Amy. They, they, it, it's as if they are hoping that you'll retire. Uh, I, I don't want to get ahead of us. Do you want to just uh, tell us what's going on uh, with you at uh, Penn and uh, what the resolution is and how you're feeling about it? Okay. Well, just very briefly, uh, these charges were brought. They kept adding different charges, I think, because... They knew that most of the allegations related to my so-called extramural speech, speech outside the school. So they they uh, sort of combed the record and trolled me and found some students who made allegations uh, which are completely false and distorted of something I said 13 years ago at a reception. There were all sorts of uh, charges. I won't go into the details. Um, and they had a hearing for three days in May. Uh, it was really uh, a kangaroo court, like uh, you wouldn't believe. I, I could give you some of the anecdotes from the hearing. Then the uh, hearing board, the Senate hearing board, faculty Senate hearing board, issued a decision, which I sent to you, which is an absolute shambles, of course, uh, as we've agreed. Uh, and then I appealed it to Liz McGill, now the deposed president, who gave it just a very superficial rubber stamp even though it violated every known principle of academic free expression and free speech, didn't matter. And now it's on the final stage of appeal at Penn before a committee, the Committee on Academic Freedom and Responsibility. It's been sitting there for almost five months now. Uh, the appeal happened to be filed a week before October 7th. So October 7th uh, was a little bit of a blow up, obviously, because it brought all these pro-Palestinian yeah. protesters to campus and all these allegations of anti-Semitism. Uh, excuse so me, nothing excuse has me for interrupting, uh, Amy, but I, I just want to read just a little bit from the summary of the of the committee's uh, letter of finding uh, in your case. Uh, we find a professor. By the way, Wax, we, yes, we find it was that leaked by. Who? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't hear that. There was a there was a glitch. Say it again. It was leaked. Right. The The decision was supposed to be confidential until there was a final decision by Penn on appeal. That's what they asked. And I was complying with that. Um, and then someone, I don't know who, leaked the hearing board decision to uh, the press, to the school newspaper. Um, okay. So that's how it got out. 
Okay, so it's out. So we're not violating any privacy by uh, just reading no. briefly. We find that Professor Wax repeatedly violated professional norms by presenting topics in reckless disregard of scholarly standards and presenting misleading and partial information which is often not scholarly or peer reviewed in order to draw sweeping conclusions with the predictable impact of negatively and inequitably harming the learning environment at the University of Pennsylvania. That's quite a sentence. And secondly, <laughs> violating widely held standards of privacy and confidentiality by discussing her perceptions of pin carry law student grades by racial groups. And third, repeatedly and persistently making discriminatory and disrespectful statements to specific targeted racial, national, ethnic, sexual orientation, and gender groups with which our students and colleagues identify. Her behavior has created a hostile campus environment and a hostile learning atmosphere. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, just to get on the table, what it is that they have found that you are guilty of having done? Well, I, those are parts broad generalizations about statements, frankly, Glenn, that are just kind of standard conservative takes on uh, very important social issues of group differences and group performance, uh, social issues that are at the heart of woke ideology, which is taking over the university and which are totally appropriate for comment and critique. I agree. I, I, I don't agree with really, that. I mean, if let, it, let, let me comment I, just for a minute. Violate. I mean, I I, I'm on your side. Yeah. I'm trying to be on your side here. I, I agree. Here, I want people to know from Appendix 1 of this uh, finding uh, from the Senate committee at the University of Penn, Pennsylvania, precisely what the statements are, some of them, which are alleged to be inconsistent with scholarly standards, injurious to the learning environment on the campus and uh, to the students at the University of uh, Pennsylvania and invidiously motivated. These are some of the things that she said to have done that are violative of the standards of uh, professional conduct that are promulgated in this letter. For example, I'll just, quoting Wax, come right out and say it that on average, blacks have lower cognitive ability than whites. You know, that's just a fact. It's a fact which you can be persecuted for stating, but it's a fact. Here's another one. I think the crime problem in this country, I'm sorry, it's true, is overwhelmingly, certainly in cities, it is a black problem. It's a minority problem, okay? Here's another one. The basic idea is that at this juncture in African-American history, shall we say, in the United States, the main problems that are holding blacks back are really problems of behavior and not of overt racism, discrimination. Really, what society is doing to us, I'm sorry, holding blacks back are really problems of, the, of, uh, of uh, behavior and not of overt racism, discrimination. Really, what society is doing to us, but the choices that people are making. And I identify the main areas of difficulty as educational underachievement, high crime rates, and family breakdown. I'm sorry to go on for so long. Here's what I find to be absolutely shocking. Those statements are demonstrable statements of fact or legitimate statements of opinion, some of which I've made myself. Uh, so... It, it, it's 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 now the you can't say that and you cannot say that without violating the uh, standards of you can't say things that are arguably true without violating standards of conduct. That's very distressing uh, to me. Amy. Well, that I'm Glenn. That is what this report says, and it is it is brazen and absurd. I mean, what this report seems to be saying is. There is one and only one set of very narrowly defined statements or opinions that one can make about these sacred protected groups and blacks, of course, being the main sacred protected group. We have an orthodoxy in this institution and you violated the orthodoxy by deviating from the script, from the accepted script. And that they seem unabashed about imposing that uh, 
while at the same time talking about, you know, how they have to protect academic freedom, they have to protect free speech. I mean, what they've done in this report on me and in punishing me is 100% glaringly, overtly inconsistent with their general statements. And I'll just take an example. The statement of President Pen President Liz McGill to Congress back in December. We adhere to First Amendment standards in the protections that we give our members. She, I can only call that one thing, Glenn, that is lying to Congress. They attempt to distinguish. They attempt to distinguish between your right uh, under the First Amendment to speak your mind and your conduct as a member of the faculty and as a teacher, which they allege to be injurious in conduct uh, from uh, uh, the point of view of the of the black students and and the students of color in uh, in the university. They say it's not about you having a right to speak. They say it's about how you're exploiting your office to the detriment of the students. Well, if if stating alternative opinions for which there is tremendous amount of factual backup, right, is exploiting your position and harming the students. Well, that is tantamount to a narrow orthodoxy for what teachers can uh, say when they are teaching about a controversial subject. I mean, I don't I, see I agree with you. Uh, that's why I'm a very, very disturbed by this. I mean, so you, you're of, a, of the opinion that the crime problem in the cities is basically a black problem. I think you're quoted somewhere in this complaint, uh, this finding, I should say, as saying that uh, it, it's very hard to be a homicide victim of a white perpetrator in New York City, or words to that effect. Now, uh, I can understand having many decades of college teaching experience, how saying that into a classroom might upset some students. What I can't understand <laughs> is how the fact that students are upset by something having been said could result in the disciplinary uh, condemnation. I mean, the, the sanctions here, may I, can, can I, let me just uh, share for a minute uh, what it is that um, this uh, committee of the Faculty Senate of the University of Pennsylvania has uh, indicated as the appropriate uh, sanction. Public reprimand expressed by university leadership. Loss of your chair, your name chair, to reflect Wax's unsuitability for university or school honors. Requirement to note in your public appearances that she is not speaking for or as that last, that bit. She's not speaking for, of course not, but she's not speaking as a member of the Penn Carey Law School uh, faculty of the University of Pennsylvania. One year suspension at half pay, loss of summer pay in perpetuity. Unbelievable. Uh, they, they further recommend that, um, I, I'm sorry, I lost my place there. Uh, well, maybe referring to moving my office and my classes out of the building. That's oh, the most oh, yeah. risible. Future participation. Given significant factual disputes over statements and interactions in Professor Wax's classes, we recommend Penn Carey Law School records her classes and ensures that the rec recordings are preserved by the dean of students to better facilitate resolution of any future disputes. When feasible, we recommend that her classes are co-taught with another faculty member. We recommend that Professor Wax's office be moved out of Penn Carey Law School buildings and that her classes are taught outside Penn Larry Law School buildings. We recommend Professor Wax not receive any committee assignments or advising roles. Uh, for thinking that the crime problem in American cities is largely a black problem. For thinking that cognitive ability on average is different between racial groups. That is scandalous because those things are true. Uh, they're demonstrably true. I but said, it. I mean, I don't think you know, I mean, we can, we can then we can go in and talk about what that means, why that is, what are the qualifications, what's the, you know, I mean, there's, it's not like there's nothing to debate here, but you can't. <laughs> 
You can't destroy people for making truthful statements at a university. That's, that's just the end of the day. That's it. That's it. We might as well call the whole thing off. I agree. I agree. But, you know, they are sending a clear signal, a clear message. And it is a message not just to me, Glenn, but it is to my students. And my students know the message that is being sent and to fellow faculty and to everyone at Penn. Truth doesn't matter. It does not matter whether a statement is true or false. We will punish you for it. So you might as well just erase the veritas from our mission statement. Our mission statement is not to search for knowledge and the truth. Our mission statement is not to preserve uh, the past knowledge that we have accumulated. It is to peddle in orthodoxy, make a special group of students always feel good and feel warm and happy about themselves, never subject them to anything upsetting, anything discomforting. Uh, we have to place them into a warm bath and make sure that they stay there. And as you say, let's just call the whole thing off. I mean, we might as well just pour all of this money into some kind of, uh, you know, summer camp or uh, other, you know, recreational facility. There's no reason to have a university if that's your standard. And this whole behavior thing, Glenn, that is sophistry of the highest degree. Of course, speech is behavior. But Glenn, it's a special kind of behavior that gets special protections in a university, in an institution of higher learning, in order for that institution to uh, perform and to advance its mission. Well, this has been known forever. This is part of the discourse. This report, really, it it is issued from a abject position of total ignorance about not only what universities are for, but the standards of protection for the exchange of ideas. It is It is a primitive, shambolic document, which they ought to be ashamed of, uh, but they're not. And, and here's why they're not, Glenn, because they have failed to articulate a coherent, consistent, intelligible standard for speech and expression of ideas at Penn because they want to be able to punish the people that they do not like, conservatives, dissenters, and they want to be able to protect the people that they do like, pro-Palestinians, anti-Semites, people who champion the oppressed as they see them. They are completely partisan and they want to be able to maintain their partisanship. And this kind of bullshit is the way to, to do it. Okay, I'm going to let the Palestinian comment go because I don't want to get a sidetrack and, you know, the left is more than that. The, the, the left that they're protecting, the diversity in people are more than that. But in any case, um, I, it seems to me that one driving force here is our students feel unsafe in Wax's presence. We must protect them. Hostile learning environment, hostile environment for the campus. Uh, another thing here is uh, she's talking out of school. So this business of privacy, if, if you have made the statement in uh, our conversations here in the past that on, on your observation, uh, black students didn't do as well academically in the law school classes as uh, they uh, might have done. They were clustering at the bottom. You said something words to that effect. They're saying you violated the student's privacy by making racial generalizations based on your experience irregardless of whether or not what you said was factually accurate because uh, it creates an environment in which the students fear that inferences will be made about them as individuals from the fact that they belong to a group that you characterized on your experience as not doing so well. So what do you say about that? Well, first of all, that privacy argument, okay, was made long ago. It is contestable based on the actual standards in the law. So let's get that on the table and very clear because I did not name individual students. I made 
generalizations about groups. Okay, so there's a very strong argument that that is no privacy violation at all. Well, that's a technical legal argument. I've already pu been punished for that by having my course taken away from me. And it's a very small tail that's wagging a very large dog, Glenn, because there are multiple other allegations. And for them to just sort of say, well, at the very least, she violated privacy, even if that other stuff is, you know, bullshit, questionable nonsense, uh, that really does not allow this sanction to hold up. I'm sorry. That is not what they said here. Uh, this is a very small part of what they are indicting me for. Let's be clear. They are indicting me for making all sorts of perfectly respectable statements of fact and opinion, which out there in the real world and even in other universities uh, would pass muster, right? So this is, you know, once again, another instance of, of sophistry, I would say. On the hostile environment, um, you know, making us uncomfortable, making us feel unsafe, Glenn, that whole line of argument, that whole set of allegations about student discomfort, student upset, student offense, I'm sorry, you can have free expression and a free exchange of rigorous ideas, or you can have students objecting based on unsafe environment and penalizing professors for unsafe environment, but you can't have both. The two are completely incompatible, right? You have to choose. And this whole shtick of every time a student says they're upset and they complain and they're offended, that shuts down what the professor says and results in a penalty to the professor, right? That you can't have any kind of rigorous truth-seeking function uh, or activity with that threat constantly dangling over your head. We have to get rid of this idea Right? that students uh, can, by invoking their feeling of lack of safety, shut down the discourse. I'm sorry. And I mostly it's too. fake anyway. And it's selective. It's very selective. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to bring up what happened on October 7th, but it's a very big part of our landscape now. And when, okay. when Jewish students feel offended or upset, nobody cares. And I can tell you that when I open the New York Times every morning and feel offended and upset, nobody cares. Right. Well, so, I, 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 would, you know, I, we, would, I would point out that you can't have it both ways either. You can't have that identity politics and DEI is BS uh, when the uh, students of color invoke it and have it that identity politics is uh, OK and uh, the topic du jour when Jewish students invoke it. I mean, you well, either. I am not. I don't think that Jewish, I actually am very suspicious of these claims of anti-Semitic upset on campus. I am a free speech absolutist. Why? Because frankly, as they used to say, is it good for the Jews? Is it good for conservatives? Conservatives <laughs> should be very wary of these claims of, you know, uh, offense and lack of safety because it will be turned against them. It will predictably be turned against them as it has been turned against me. So if conservatives want to buy a space in the university or in intellectual discourse, they have to turn away those arguments and say, I'm sorry. And the Supreme Court, you know, the Supreme Court is very wise on these topics. They always get it right. They say that's a heckler's veto. And we cannot allow heckler's vetoes to determine but it is acceptable to say they have been 100% clear on this. And we forget those lessons at our peril. Let's talk about racial realism, uh, which is something that you want to talk about. You say you're writing a piece. What is it and, and what's, what's at stake in the debate about racial realism? Well, I think there's a group of thinkers that has now uh, been writing and speaking to each other and exchanging uh, ideas about the relationship of race realism to efforts to quell or defeat or banish woke, the woke uh, control over our institutions. And what I mean by woke Please. is the big idea, right, that there is oppressor and oppressed 
uh, that there are groups who um, are experience disparities and disadvantages, and uh, those disparities and disadvantages are all due to racism and to oppressive behavior on the part of privileged groups. Uh, and therefore, we have to rearrange every aspect of society to ensure parity between those groups. This, of course, especially applies to Blacks. We see it in the university. We see it in the corporate sector, the nonprofit sector. Um, all of these programs, all of these initiatives to try and attain proportional representation in every position imaginable. Uh, and you know, the whole world is being turned upside down for that purpose. Oh, that's not, uh, that's not race. I'm sorry. Excuse me for interrupting. You're describing me, the, the belief that a disparity is ipso facto evidence of uh, unfairness. And you're saying race realism is an effort to rebut that position? Correct. Correct. Race. Re the question is, how is that position best rebutted? What is the most uh, powerful so, uh, argument um, that can be uh, enlisted against that position, which many people object to. And I think there has developed a consensus that uh, the only way to defeat wokeism is to talk about the reality that there are disparities, real disparities in ability, uh, in cognitive ability, in behaviors like uh, criminality, which account for the fact that Blacks uh, and maybe some other groups like Hispanics are underrepresented in certain positions. So let's take an example. Why are there no Black physics professors at Harvard? Uh, we have to get more Black physics professors. We have to get uh, more Black mathematicians, uh, people in tech. Uh, people in in positions of power in Silicon Valley. You, you could just name a whole host of, yeah, of let, jobs. Let me, let me interject. Let me let me interject for a minute because I'm, I'm trying to follow the argument. So there are false claims being made to the effect that I see a disparity, no black physicists at Harvard, and I therefore conclude there's some unfairness that has to be remedied by some kind of DEI intervention, and that's a false story. So that's point one. Point two is it needs to be rebutted. The strongest way to rebut it, and that's a claim that I think could be questioned, is to bring the people's attention to the fact that there are natural differences between the groups in ability or orientation or inclination. And the question what we mean by natural, because we're supposed to be realists. We're staying in touch with reality. What exactly is the reality? But that's point number two. There are these natural differences. Um, and that they are the, con the, the pr principal determinative of the determinator or uh, factor causing uh, the uh, disparities which uh, are not in fact due to discrimination, which is yet another point. Uh, because I can imagine that there could be other factors that could be at work, like culture and oriented values and you know practices, behaviors and whatnot. You said behaviors, but behaviors are not in any straightforward way naturally determined. They're the product of human culture. So I, I wonder if you could address yourself to to uh, those concerns. A, the strongest argument, really? I mean, or maybe just the one you prefer. And B, well, whatever happened to the rest of human civilization beyond the things that are determined by our natural genetic endowments that are also implicated in these disparities? Well, first of all, the word natural is your word, not mine. I think you're mixing up two things. One is just the mere fact, right, that, as you mentioned earlier, there are cognitive, measurable cognitive ability differences right now, today, between, let's say, blacks and whites. And that this is just a number. This is just a fact, right? Uh, and and we yeah, call it a uh, the fact. Populations, the populations on the average. This is Charles Murray territory. It's bell curves. The curves overlap. But yeah, the, the curves have different <laughs> means. Yeah. That's a fact. I, I agree with you 100%. That's a fact. Right. And, and distribution. So Charles Murray's book, Facing Reality, pretty much sums up the factual underpinnings of this. I just straightforward. And nobody, frankly, Glenn, uh, even the people who are upset by this, like John McWhorter wrote a little bit about this and 
Coleman Hughes is is not too happy about it. Tom Sowell either, right? They have never seriously challenged the reality of these facts. That these facts are somehow uh, false. They they are. Uh, but you know, they're they're not the only facts. That was the implication of my earlier uh, intervention. Okay. They are facts, but they're well, not the only facts. So whether or not they're the they're first not- order fact that needs to be invoked here. And whether or not we can demonstrate that causally they are the disproportionately most significant facts is a, is a separate question. Well, correct. So I think that one needs to go a little further than just invoking the fact. And Charles Murray does that in his book, Facing Reality. He says, regardless of the cause of this and you know what's behind it, which is really a separate question, right? The fact of differences in cognitive ability er, is significant. It's significant for predicting people's performance in certain kinds of roles. And those roles are primarily occupational. So he's very focused on occupation, but occupation is extremely important because that determines your status, your earnings, uh, a lot of important things in life that uh, bear on your well-being, well-being of your family, et cetera. But really, this is pretty much focused on uh, the employment sphere. Okay, you're right. There's other spheres that are uh, very significant and important, and we can talk about those. Um, but it will predict how well you do in certain jobs. And so to expect that there will be parity and equal proportional representation in jobs, no matter how cognitively demanding, is simply unrealistic. We should not turn our society upside down through DEI, through various mechanisms, uh, various programs and initiatives in order to achieve the parity that we cannot reasonably expect, given the facts on the ground. And that is the essential race realist argument, right? Um, now, what is what do other behaviors have to do with it? Well, uh, it's not good for your occupational prospects to break the law, right? So criminal behavior also bears on this. So we can just take the plain old fact that rates of crime are higher among certain groups than others. Uh, and that also contributes to the lack of parity, the lack of proportional representation. There may be other behaviors, other behaviors that are only loosely related to cognitive ability, um, such as conscientiousness, some of the personality traits, uh, the um, time. Well, we know they are. We know these things are. This is something that Jim Heckman at Chicago, the Nobel winning economist has been uh, talking about for a long time. The diversity of human skills, it's not just cognitive ability and so on. And he's also talked, he has James Heckman, the Nobel Prize economist at Chicago, about the importance of the family, which is a cultural institution, uh, about the early childhood experiences and neurological development of youngsters, which depends upon how their parents and the local environment in which they're embedded uh, interacts with them and things of this kind. So, okay. Yeah, but we're now getting beyond facts of actual differences and disparities to the question of causes. I think really all you need to do as a big first step, and this is a first step that a lot of people resist, right, is just posit that there are these average group differences. Like you said, not just in cognitive ability, but in non-cognitive attributes, um, in discount rate, in, you know, your performance on the marshmallow yeah. test, in delayed gratitude. Uh, you know, impulsiveness, right. uh, lots and lots of traits that that people differ on and that on average groups differ on. And they all bear on how people do in life, in society, their prospects for getting ahead and the like. So I think all Charles Murray is really trying to say in his book, and I've reviewed his book uh, in Claremont, is let's just take that first step and face the reality of these actual discrepancies. And once we do that, we see the absurdity of the woke demand and the absurdity of the woke inference. I, I want to stop you there. Must- 
if I can, I mean, I'm, I'm with you, but I want to stop to try to introduce a little bit of nuance and not that you are not nuanced. I'm not saying that. Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, first of all, I want to uh, point out that I have had Charles Murray on the program when Facing Reality came out not that long ago. And I, quote, reviewed it, close quote, in the sense of interacting with him about it in a positive manner. I, I thought he was right. The book has two parts. It, it's empirical. The whole book is empirical with a couple of uh, boilerplate commentary type chapters, but it's, you know, he says uh, IQ, uh, cognitive ability test scores, and he's got a battery of tests across the board, and, you know, there are racial differences in the distribution. And he says criminal participation. He goes carefully over a couple of dozen American cities looking at the local uh, crime report data and whatnot and racial identification and disproportionate participation of African Americans in criminal offending. Those are facts. Those facts should be recognized. Let's recognize those facts. Now, in the battle between the realist and the woke, as you have framed it, um, you're saying that an acknowledgement of those facts goes a long way toward winning that battle for the realists. And I, I want to ask something about that, which is, let's say that there's a sensible woke, a woke that doesn't reject reality, but that still wants more parity. They want more black airline pilots. They want more black students in um, uh, computer science, whatever. The, the achievement of that goal, say that blacks are 12% of the population, maybe you don't go for 12% because you are recognizing the reality of the fact that you have a difference in the distributions. Maybe you go for 6%. I'm not advocating this. I'm just saying observing the reality of the group differences did not refute the aspiration to have more blacks as airline pilots or more blacks as uh, computer science majors. Uh, it's a long distance between 12% and whatever, wherever the chips fall. Having the desire to increase black participation in certain sectors of society might be a good thing, even if it's costly. You haven't refuted that desire by pointing out that it's costly. That's okay, the counter Okay, but let me just say, it is in many cases, and this is once again another empirical question, Glenn, going to require a double standard, right? So if you observe, and, and Charles Murray has done this exercise in his book, if you observe that the average IQ for airline pilots is, you know, 120 or whatever, let's just pick a right. number, which right. is well above average for what, right? And you crunch the numbers and you look at the bell curve. And of course, anybody who knows Statistics 101 knows that the further out you go on the right tail, the larger the discrepancy is between the lower scoring group, the one shifted down and the higher yeah. scoring group, just because of the way of those bell curves behave. Now you've got yeah. ratios of, you know, 30 to one, 40 to one. I think that's Part of the problem is that people are not very numerate and they don't understand how these bell curves work. You know, they don't understand, for example, that because Jews have an average uh, of 15 point IQ advantage, which is really quite, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge. Once you it's get out to deviation. three standard deviations, you're talking, uh, you know, 60 to yeah. one, 70 to one. Uh, so, the question is to go from, okay, we don't want parity, but let me first say that, you know, I don't see any evidence that people aren't demanding full parity and that if they don't get it, they're going to be complaining endlessly. I don't see any relenting on this front at all, right? They, you would have to imagine an alternative universe in which people actually brought into the conversation, well, you know, there are there, there are these gaps for now. And we have to deal with that. The people never say that. Okay. Every article you read about these disparities, these disparate impacts, these discrepancies, they never, never mention, you know, this glaring elephant in the room. This, yeah. Well, that's them. That's I them. I am, I am mentioning, I am mentioning it. I'm acknowledging the elephant and I'm saying the normative question, the value question, the, the moral question about, disparities, they're too big by race in America given our history, is not refuted 
by observing that the reality on the ground is that, and again, it could be given our history, our history could have something to do with it. There are real population differences. That's a reality. I agree. It has to be taken on board. But it could be taken on board in the surface of one or another kind of social philosophy. And the distinction between woke and realist, it seems to me, is more than simply a question about acknowledging a fact. It's a difference in, I mean, you, you gestured at this. You said, and I'm not saying you're wrong to say so, that it would require, if you wanted more parity, that you somehow had different standards. And that's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> if you've got different population distributions and you want something other than what the natural draw would give you, you're going to have to intercede in some way. And at the bottom, at the end of the day, it's going to come to different standards in one shape, way, or form or another. That's true. It may be tolerable or not. But the argument over whether or not it's tolerable is a completely different argument than the realist argument. Okay. I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm going to have to agree with you that the, <laughs> the, no, that the, the argument that, well, you know, there are these discrepancies um, and therefore we shouldn't be pushing for any more representation than we already have. That argument does not make itself. Right. I right. think what the realists are focused on before we get into this much more nuanced uh, discussion is they're focused on defeating the, oh, it must be racism. It must be nefarious. Let's blame white society and let's blame white people. And let's blame white, white males. And they're guilty as charged, right? Signed, sealed, and, and that's it. There can be no argument. I think their first charge is to try to defeat that because they think, number one, it's false. There's, you know, no good evidence for it when you've got all these other powerful explanations. They think it's divisive and uh, they want to get out from under this guilty verdict because they really do not believe it's their fault. So that's sort of the first priority. But I think once you get past that priority, you have a much harder question, which is, uh, you know, how much. How much do we tolerate some kind of relaxation of the standard or double standard? These are really two separate questions, but they're very closely related, right? So take medical school admissions. There's now a push to change the whole way that medical students are selected. I heard a presentation on this. Uh, for the MCAT exam, which is like the LSAT exam, we're no longer going to pick the people with the very highest scores because disproportionately those people are going to be white and Asian and they're going to crowd out everybody else, especially since now, you know, Asians are great test takers and they're just cleaning up on these exams, right? We are going to have a kind of threshold minimum score. And once you get past that score, we're not going to look at your score again. This is literally what they're proposing. Uh, instead, we're going to look at other stuff. We're going to yeah. look at, do you have the kind of character traits? Are you kind? Are you nurturing? Yeah. Are you caring? Have you had a difficult life's journey? Uh, you know, all of these different yeah. criteria, um, those criteria, frankly, have to be justified in and of themselves. Right. What is it about having a hard life journey that's necessarily going to make you a better doctor? That remains to be proven. Right. Can we? Well, let, let me let me just interject. It could help me interpret okay. your score. Your MCAT score might mean something different to me if I know something else about your background, things that you've had to overcome, advantages that you didn't enjoy. Uh, the same score between two people, one of whom had those advantages and one of whom didn't, wouldn't necessarily be indicative of the same talent. But, but that's a side point. I, 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 I take your main point, and I, I actually want to agree with you. Uh, you agree with me. I want to agree with you. Um, which is the, the equity mongers who are constantly insisting disparity is racism are hoist on their own petard when you and Charles Mary come up and say, well, wait, let's, let's look at the data. You ask for it, I want to say to those people who are trying to shut you up. You made such a big deal out of, well, the medical school class is not uh, respective of the population that you invited an inquiry 
along the lines of, well, what does it take to be a successful medical student and who's got those skills? Um, so, and then they want to shut you up. They, then they want to say, you, you haven't been provoked. You know, okay, why are the disparities? I don't think it's racism. Here's why I think it is. They want to shut you up, which means they don't have any arguments. So, right. I, Except to sign I, you, bring a very yeah, good that's job. that's not an argument. <laughs> yeah, but it's working. It's working, I'm telling you. And it's distorting absolutely everything. Okay? But once you get into this business of, well, we recognize the disparities, but maybe they don't matter so much. Well, this becomes a very, very vexed empirical question, Glenn, because frankly, it is wishful thinking. It is fairy tales that those extra smarts don't matter when you're talking about, uh, you know, a sector like American medicine, which is cutting edge and innovative that really is at the whole world is depending on to make progress uh, in this area. And, you know, are we do we really want to sacrifice those extra IQ points uh, for these big kind of muzzy gauzy ideas of social justice that makes me very nervous frankly uh because i think that we're you know we may be going down a very bad path here and it's all based on none of it is empirically verified i mean they you know we do have a lot of data that tells us that the extra IQ points really count i don't know if you uh, know lubinsky uh david lubinsky data he has a wonderful set of papers in which he looks at pre-adolescents who have done extremely well on the SAT. And at that age, uh, for someone to get like a 700 on the SAT, well, that puts them really in the stratosphere as far as intelligence goes. But even within his sample of extraordinary kids, he has the kids who get a 650 at age 12 and the kids who get an 800. Well, that's a huge range. He follows them through their life. And guess what? It matters even in the stratosphere of intelligence where you rank, like in the top 0.01% at age 13. It lockstep predicts your achievements, your uh, patents, your papers, your scientific contributions at a later age. So, yes. Each extra IQ point does seem to count when you're talking about extraordinary achievement and accomplishment. Um, maybe okay, not. Okay, I, I, I want to. Yeah. No, I want to make an observation, which is that it's true. If I could have a cross section of individuals and I measure their IQs, the smarter people do better as individuals. It doesn't follow from that that if I do what you were talking about, I have a minimum score that say it's high, but it's not as high as it could be. And I admit anybody above that minimum score, which means I might have to ration seats because I might have more people coming in than I have space for, that the profession will be dumber, will be less innovative. It's going to sound like a technical point. The frontier could be driven by the very, 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 very best people. And the people who are somewhat behind that it's sure not going to matter if I get a doctor and my doctor is not the smarter doctor, but whether or not medicine is held back by that is a separate question about which I don't think Lubinsky's data, as you described it, gives an answer. I, I think you, I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, really, when you talk about a profession like medicine, you're talking about the journeyman practitioners, right? And a very legitimate question of, you know, how smart do these people have to be as opposed to having other qualities and other attributes and perfectly yeah, legitimate. But, but I just want to, excuse me for interrupting. Excuse me for interrupting. I just want to notice there is a danger. Suppose you dumb down medical education broadly because you've changed the admission standards for some part of that class and you stop teaching whatever it is, organic chemistry or whatever it is, what, you know, uh, physiology. I, you know, I don't know anything about medicine. You do. Uh, you stop teaching those things at the technical edge because the average person in your classroom is not as swift. That hurts everybody. That is already happening. It seems to me. Right. That is already happening. And I mean, one of the things that's happening is 
that the very, you know, top of the field, the, the most exclusive medical schools, which should be training the medical scientists, the people who are, um, you know, able to, to be at the cutting edge, those institutions are now admitting people maybe with, they're obsessed with getting equity and with getting diversity. And so they are lowering their standards. They're not really doing what they're supposed to do, which is train the very best and the brightest, all in the name of getting that diversity there. So that I think is really a, a kind of untoward trend. I see that as sort of a danger zone. Um, so all of this stuff is going on. And I think the race realists uh, and the anti wokeistas even those who are not particularly invested in race realism, are very concerned about these trends, which are happening everywhere uh, on all fronts. It's happening in law, too. Washington State just dropped its requirement that uh, their trainees take the bar. Uh, and I think other states are probably going to follow suit. You mean you can become a lawyer? without having taken the bar exam in Washington State? Washington State, yes, yeah. that's a, um, a new thing. I see, and it's and motivated by racial disparities in the bar passage rates? Yes. Is that is that the motivating fact? Yes. But listen, Amy, I want to apologize because I need to terminate our conversation now because as I explained, I had another thing and, and we're not done, okay. we should have another conversation. But I want, to I want to make a little speech and my little speech is, free Amy Wax. <laughs> You want well, to free Julian Assange? Okay, you can free Julian Assange. I want to free Amy Wax. I mean, I think you're being railroaded with a capital R, and it's an outrage, and I don't mind saying so. Everybody should get their hands on this leaked letter and read it for themselves. It's unbelievable. The, the thought police are on the loose at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to get that on the record. Well, thank you. And I, I really appreciate your support. But you're absolutely right that until people, you know, wake up and say this, this is just unacceptable, we have thousands of alumni of Penn who really need to, you know, get on it. Uh, and until we can motivate them, um, nothing's going to happen. Because the people at Penn have shown that they can't be embarrassed, you know, even by stuff that, you know, ought to be embarrassing them. Uh, they don't seem to care. Uh, and that, that in itself is disturbing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your time. <laughs>